The following program contains coarse language and images that may disturb some viewers. We heard the news that they're actually gonna get to Kabul very soon because they're just in the border. And that's when it just hit me. Police officers took off their uniforms, ministers fled their ministries, immigration officers went home. And then for a period, we had total anarchy and lawlessness. On Sunday, August 15, the insurgent army that calls itself the Taliban took the Afghan capital, Kabul. After almost 20 years and more than $1 trillion spent by the United States and its allies, the city fell with barely a shot fired. It's just no one thought that it would be an absolute victory at this rapid a scale. It was lightning speed. My family and everybody was panicking. They were calling me. They were like, Ariana, you, you guys need to get out of there. People realized that the city had fallen. Everyone rushed to the airport. So you had thousands of people on the tarmac and everyone was attempting to get on the plane. I was just visualizing that I get up to the end of the ramp. I got the lucky cargo deck with 200 odd other people and we just had to sit down, legs crossed. And as we took off, the plane takes off pretty steeply and we just ended up in everyone's lap as we took off. The desperation led to heartbreaking scenes at Kabul's airport. It's a disaster and I cannot believe that the entire world right now, they're just watching and they just left Afghanistan in chaos, just like that. Me and my family are just waiting for a visa to Australia. We cannot do anything. We can't do anything. People of Afghanistan right now are living in a cage. Yes, I feel that. I feel we are in a cage. When there's no freedom, when there's no rights, when there's no justice, when there's no little hope. I don't know what the Pashtun word for clusterfuck is, but this is the most ridiculously outrageous screw up that I've ever experienced or even heard of. Some people inevitably will now begin to say that the Western project in Afghanistan was doomed. I don't think it was doomed, it was botched. Tonight on Four Corners, the tragic saga of the fall of Kabul, told by those who escaped and those left behind. And how America's longest war ended in ignominious failure. On the morning of Sunday, August 15, Obadullah Bahia, an Australian-educated university lecturer, was at home in his apartment overlooking Kabul. I remember waking up that morning, it was a very normal day. I had to go for a meeting, and I walked into the meeting. 30 minutes in, the meeting was wrapped up. I sat in my car, and as I got out, I realised I checked my phone actually, and I realized that the Taliban had entered the city, which were rumors actually, because they were just outside, but just that rumor was enough for the Afghan armed forces and the police and everyone who was associated with the government to just drop arms and walk away, uh, which meant that people were in a frenzy. Afghan Australian Saad Maseni the boss of Afghanistan's Tolo News Channel was in London speaking with his editors in Kabul. By about two or three o'clock, it became apparent that something was happening or something had happened. And when we inquired, we discovered that Ashraf Ghani and his close aides had fled the country. Afghanistan's president, Ashraf Ghani, has gone. He's left the country as Taliban leaders push for what they say is a peaceful transfer of power in Kabul. 
we were talking to friends in the street, but also to members of the senior staff of President Ashraf Ghani, talking to a network of intelligence people who were tracking what was going on. US-based military strategist David Kilcullen, who has advised international governments, was speaking to his contacts on the ground in Kabul. And all of our military contacts on the ground, the special forces guys and the local commanders who were holding the line on the eastern and southern part of the city, immediately realised the game was up. And about a half hour after that, Ashraf Ghani was reported leaving uh, the city uh, in a helicopter flying to uh, Uzbekistan. He should have stayed on. He's the leader of a country. He should have risked it. He should have managed the transition process. And there was a transition pro process in play. He fled like a coward. Shortly after that, I was on the phone with his chief of staff, who was essentially abandoned on the landing zone uh, with the president's bag as the president flew off. And then, of course, the news that Ashraf had fled, Ashraf Ghani had fled, triggered the, the total collapse of the, of the government and the state. Police officers took off their uniforms. Ministers fled their, uh, their ministries. Immigration officers went home. And then for a period, we had total anarchy and lawlessness. The Taliban, who had committed to not come into the city, were forced actually to come in and fill that vacuum. Uh, just showing you again those pictures from earlier of Taliban fighters behind uh, the desk of the presidential palace. I was right up until the last minute quite sure that Kabul would hold out. And the reason that I thought it was was because literally two days beforehand, President Biden promised up and down in an answer uh, in the White House that the US would come with air support and all kinds of other uh, support to enable the Afghans to hold out. And in the event, the US did nothing. Thousands of people descended on Kabul's airport looking for a way out. Among the crowd was former Australian Army Major Robert Davis, who had been working as a logistics contractor in Afghanistan and was now trying to get out. When I got into the terminal, there was just bedlam. There was hundreds of people trying to get to the check-in counter. There was bags getting thrown over the, the top of people to to get to the check-in counter because the thought process was there that my bag's there, so you must give me a ticket. Afghan parliamentarian Shukriya Barakzai was at the airport waiting to fly to India when her flight was cancelled. And I saw a large number of my colleagues, like former member of parliament, current member of parliament, ministers, deputy ministers. And I was like, what's going on? One of my colleagues, he told me that, uh, you know, Taliban are getting into the Kabul. So that was like a kind of panic time. I, I was just laughing and I say it's impossible. But uh, my colleagues say, no, it's, uh, it is the truth. Uh, Taliban get into the Kabul, and I was, it was really shocking to me. Pop star Ariana Saeed, a long-time campaigner for women's rights in Afghanistan, is one of the most recognisable faces in the country and a long-time target of the Taliban. She was desperate to escape. By the time we were at the airport, Taliban, you know, suddenly came, like, took over Kabul within a span of a few hours. And we were at the airport trying to check in. And we heard gunshots and everything. And then all of a sudden, the entire security at the airport and the entire staff, they run away and they left the airport uh, just like that. Uh, as a result of which uh, the entire, like, groups of people that were there, they rushed into the planes and the planes were like full of them. And uh, the, the plane couldn't take off. Uh, the pilots also ran away, they were scared. Uh, so we couldn't take that plane um, that day. For many, there would be no escape. Pashtana Durrani, the founder of a charity educating 7,000 girls across the country, was one of many women who went into hiding. 
I completely lost myself that day. I I did cry a lot. We did. All of us were torn into pieces. We were shaken, and it was just a paralyzing day. At the airport that night, Robert Davis sat in the airside gravel with a group of Afghans who were escaping their country. Now we we spent the night in front of the gate, in the dirt, and I was walking up and down. Um, in front of the gate, or past the gate. And then I could see people jumping over the fence. Sunrise came and went, and nine o'clock came, 10 o'clock came. Shukriya Baraksai had managed to get onto another flight bound for Turkey, but it was one of many that never left. Unfortunately, the plane uh, could not uh, take off because uh, because of the huge crowd and the captain was announced that the passenger with the gun should uh, leave their gun out uh, and they themselves should go out but uh, nobody was listening to that the crowd was every minute get more and more and more uh, where unfortunately the captain switched off the ventilation system and the light and um, I was been struggling, uh, well, all the night uh, without any facilities, light, water, or ventilation. Unable to get on a flight, Ariana Saeed left the airport. Her fiancé recorded this video on his mobile phone. You can hear gunfire in the background. After leaving the airport on the 15th, we went to a relative's house. We spent the night there hiding. And then the next day, uh, because Taliban had started door-to-door -door search, uh, we had to take a risk and, and leave the house again and, and try to attempt to get to the, to the airport one more time. So we started driving and we um, passed uh, about five Taliban checkpoints. One of them actually stopped uh, our car and uh, he put the light inside and the minute he saw me, uh, obviously I was covering myself with a hijab and he could only see my eyes. Luckily, he didn't say anything. He, he said, just go. Ariana was a Taliban target, having been a television star and pop singer. Mullahs had asked for her head, and a bus carrying staff out of a TV station where she had performed was bombed. I've been a threat for a long time, and I've, I've been through a lot of problems with the Taliban and with the mullahs and stuff like that. So for me, you know, if, if I got caught by the Taliban, uh, God knows what they would have done to me. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not scared of dying. I really am not. But one thing that was on my mind this entire time, I was like, oh my God, I don't want to be caught alive. I'm sorry. And I was really scared of that because, you know, I kept on remembering this, this woman that uh, they burned her alive a few years ago, if you remember, her name was Farhonda. And I was thinking, if they catch me, that's exactly what they would do to me. And I was scared of getting raped even. So these things were on my mind. I was like, please, God, if, it's okay for me to die. I hope they just shoot me, but don't take me alive. Politician Shukriya Baraksai also had good reason to be afraid. She too had been outspoken about the Taliban's treatment of women and had been targeted by a suicide bomber in 2014. As she waited on a plane stuck on the tarmac, she learned they were hunting her again. I got a message and photos that a group of militants or Taliban loot my house. So like the first door was been shut. At the first hours they get into the Kabul. They did that to my place. And um, I was kind of hurried and whatever I had at the house, it was been looted. And, um, I realized that, okay, they're after me. Her plane never took off. 
uh, I noticed that whenever corner I'm going, there was a three guy of Taliban undercover. They were like following me. When three times I found the same group of uh, people are following me and they are coming very close to, to at least to make sure that um, to or to identify me, uh, I was been terrifying. I uh, um, and and the last time um, when uh, uh, my husband was talking with a U.S. Uh, um, Army soldier, we are trying to describe that to that uh, soldier where Taliban came, and it was like that uh, fifty centimeter away from the U.S. Uh, soldier. Taliban was uh, beat us with their gun they had. And um, yeah, they, they were ready to shoot. And then thanks to the crowd, the U.S. also started shooting. And that crowd was, gave me the chance to run away from. That day, extraordinary scenes unfolded at the airport. Gunfire erupted as US troops and Taliban fighters tried to control the crowds. So it was complete mayhem. The pilots fled, the crew fled, and these people stayed on. So the sense that we have to get out as quick as we can because it's gonna be, it's gonna, we're gonna go back to the 1990s, the sort of strict Taliban rule. A sense of panic drove Afghans to desperate acts. When I was passing by the airport, we heard this loud noise of a plane taking off. I remember just looking up with my friend who was driving and we saw this gray airplane leaving and we knew that it was military. Uh, it was later that day that I saw the video of people clinging to the tires of that plane for dear life. At least two men fell to their deaths. One of them was Zaki Anwari, a teenage member of the Afghan national youth soccer team. He spoke to his best friend and teammate that morning. The young man is too afraid to be identified. The world should have that on their conscience. The international community are the culprits for those scenes. They deserted these people. They promised them a life, then offered them a way out, and then they weren't there to deliver. At the end of the day, normal human beings died. Afghans, common Afghans, people who had dreams, who had a future, uh, those were shattered. And, and it's on everyone. That blood is on everyone. As the chaos at the airport continued for another night, Robert Davis and his group huddled in a small demountable building, waiting to be ferried to the NATO base to board a US plane. It was just like a little outpost and we had rocks coming in from the crowd. The crowd was just building up to hundreds to probably more than 500, 600 people. And yeah, it started to get pretty dangerous. And the Marines were firing warning shots to keep, keep the crowd away from the flimsy chain wire fence that separated us. 
As Ariana Saeed and her fiancé arrived at the NATO base at the airport, he told her to wait in the car. Because to get inside was like a nightmare because there's like a little road, like maybe two, three metres wide, uh, and it was like filled up with like thousands of people. And you had to like literally like push your way through and, you know, through people and it, it, it was crazy. An Afghan woman handed Ariana her baby and asked her to take her through. They're like, sorry, madam, we, we, we cannot do that. We will let you in, but we cannot let her and the baby in. Unfortunately, um, they, they, they didn't do that. And then when I got in, that's actually the first time when I burst into tears. And that's all because of that baby. That baby is like still, I cannot take that picture out. And I, I don't know if, if, it, if it survived or not. I have no idea. But it was quite bad. It was really, really bad. Um, it was just heartbreaking. Ariana's fiancé filmed their final moments as they got on the plane. They were the last two people to board that night. She had just a purse and the clothes she was wearing. On the plane, people were like, I remember they were like so quiet and everybody was like really sad, really shocked. Because each one of them, every one of them, they've left, you know, the rest of their families in, in Afghanistan and nobody was like really excited and happy about being able uh, to, to come out and being on the plane at that moment. By the time he too boarded a US military plane, Robert Davis had been at the airport for almost three days. The hundreds of people bundled into American C-17s became iconic images of the fall of Kabul. And as I walked up the ramp, there were side seats on the C-17, but there was just cargo deep. And there was um, you know, families with children on the seats, which is good. And I got the lucky cargo deck with um, 200 odd other people and we just had to sit down, legs crossed. And as we took off, the plane takes off pretty steeply and we just ended up in everyone's lap um, as we took off. And people were relieved, they were exhausted. You were safe, you were with a big plane, a lot of people, and you know you were heading to Qatar and just, just safety. So it's, it's just relief. Thank you very much, everybody. The decision to withdraw by 2021 was made by former US President Donald Trump, who negotiated a deal that bypassed the elected Afghan government and legitimised the Taliban. As far as the Taliban is concerned, uh, Everybody wanted this to happen. The Taliban wanted it to happen. Uh, President Ghani was very much involved in this, as you know, and he's now dealing with the Taliban. But we're talking about 19 years we've been there, 19 years. And uh, other presidents have tried to do this. Uh, the Taliban has given a pledge, and a very strong pledge, and we'll see how that all works out. We hope it's going to work out very well. The agreement which was signed by the United States with the Taliban on the 29th of February 2020 in Doha was probably the worst single exercise in diplomacy since uh, the Munich Agreement of 1938 that sacrificed Czechoslovakia to Hitler. Professor William Maley has been writing about Afghanistan for 40 years. It ended up giving to the Taliban everything that they really wanted. 
They got a place at the high table with the United States and the status that flowed from that. They secured a, a strict timetable for the withdrawal of all US forces and contractors from Afghanistan. And in that, in that sense, it really was a catastrophic era of diplomacy. Trump's successor, Joe Biden, honoured the Taliban deal. So this is a bipartisan screw up. It's not a President Biden or a President Trump mistake, it's both. And it goes back to the original decision to negotiate with the Taliban but exclude the Afghan government from those negotiations, which effectively meant that the US was now treating the Taliban as a legitimate government. The truth is, this did unfold more quickly than we had anticipated. So what's happened? Afghanistan political leaders gave up and fled the country. The Afghan military collapsed, sometime without trying to fight. If anything, the developments of the past week reinforced that ending U.S. military involvement in Afghanistan now was the right decision. I mean, it was just ridiculous. And at that point, the Afghans were still fighting incredibly hard, losing twice as many people killed every month than the US has lost in 20 years fighting this war. So when President Biden and others came out later and said, well, it's not our fault, the Afghans wouldn't fight, that was the most nauseating piece of victim blaming that I've ever seen. Um, but whatever, if it makes you feel better, you know, pretend that it was the Afghans' fault. <laughs> President Biden tried to justify his decisions. Thousands of Afghans were still trying to get into Hamid Karzai Airport. It's 20 past five in the morning. Like many Western expats in Kabul, Andrew Quilty was trying to get Afghans out. A lot of warning shots being fired by the security forces. Yeah, that's it. Traffic's bad. And the bus, kids are crying. The drugs fall on sleep now, as we wait. It is 10 a.m. on Tuesday, the 23rd of August, and we've just thrown in the towel on uh, our attempt to get in to the airport with about 150 people. Uh, we spent about six hours trying each of the uh, three or four gates, a couple on either side of the airport. Uh, each one we were turned away. At the airport was a group of former interpreters for the Australian Defence Force who were trying to get to the gate. One of them is a man we'll call Hassan, who worked for the ADF in southern Afghanistan for three years. I went to the airport and when I saw the situation was really, really bad and the Taliban was shooting people and more crowd over there and more than 1,000 people over there. So I wasn't step along over there because everyone is looking for me so to kill me and uh, you know risk for me so that it is really really dangerous mm. Hassan is on the run with his wife and his family of four young children the family fled from their home in Kandahar to Kabul 
the Taliban have no yeah, forgiveness uh, for the work that these interpreters did facilitating our combat missions uh, in Afghanistan uh, against the Taliban and against Al Qaeda. And uh, they will take out their retribution on those individuals. There is no going to the Taliban and saying, um, I'm, the coalition are gone, I now support the Taliban. Um, that, there's no ifs, no buts, they will be killed, uh, as will their family members uh, and anybody that is associated with them. I have uh, one request uh, from Australia government. Please, please take me and my young family to Australia. My situation is really, really bad. And I'm just staying in my house like a prisoner, cannot go outside to work. And my family are also risky. And I cannot send the kids to the school. Former Army Captain Jason Skeynes worked in intelligence operations for the 205th Coalition Advisory Team. Hassan was his interpreter. He's uh, one of the G2 uh, interpreters, really nice young man. You know, I worked every single day in Afghanistan for 10 months with this individual. He was cleared to live on our base. Uh, he was cleared to walk around our base, eat in our mess, um, and live amongst us, unescorted. Uh, that was the level of clearance. Uh, he was um, with me conducting very high level strategic um, operations uh, against the Taliban. Hassan first applied for a humanitarian visa in Australia back in 2013. After eight years and twice being rejected because of an alleged association with the Taliban, 12 days ago, he was offered a temporary visa and told to go to the airport. Like many, he was unable to get one of the last flights out. He's now in danger because of the service that he gave, not only to myself, but to the Australian government, to the Australian Defence Force and to other Australian officers on the ground over a number of years in Afghanistan. And as a result of that service, uh, he is now hunted um, down and will be living uh, in fear of his life and his young family as well. In two weeks, the US flew more than 122,000 people out of Kabul and Australia evacuated 4,100. Left behind in terrible conditions were thousands of Afghans who had queued outside the airport for days. I was terrified at that point, as were the people I was with. It was just the, the crush of the crowd, the desperation, the fear, the, the environment itself. I mean, it was, this is thousands of people um, lined up along this sewage canal through which they would have to walk to get to the other side and, and into the airport if they were lucky enough to have their names called out. Um, it was dark, you know, there were, uh, you know, pickpockets, there were Taliban beating people back. Um, it was, you know, there was, there was, a, 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 it was a microcosm of like a, you know, breakdown in society. What's happening outside the wire there is a humanitarian catastrophe in its own right. Children dying, people getting trampled, people running out of water. The troops and the aid workers on the front line are doing their absolute best. But what is happening is that lots of people who don't have the right documentation have flooded to the airport, understandably. That's stopping people that do have the right documentation from making it the last 500 yards to get in. And again, this could all have been avoided, right? I don't know what the Pashtun word for clusterfuck is, but this is the most ridiculously outrageous screw up that I've ever experienced or even heard of. Um, and it's, an, it's just an embarrassment on the level of basic competence alone that this has been allowed to happen. Biden and his team seem to me to have made two catastrophic mistakes. One is uh, a, a mistake of 
uh, underestimating the dangers for stability in Afghanistan that would flow from the specifics of the agreement that was inherited from uh, President Trump. And the other was to display an almost complete indifference to um, the over 30 million people in Afghanistan who had put their trust in the United States. Uh, and that, I think, is one reason why the ramifications for the United States of the failure in Afghanistan are far greater than the ramifications even from the fall of Saigon in uh, 1975, uh, because uh, the United States is seen in many parts of the world now as an untrustworthy ally. Uh, as a power that essentially became bored and decided to walk away. Eleven days after the fall of Kabul, the last Australian evacuation mission flew out. Within hours, a suicide bomber attacked. The blast killed almost 200 people, including Afghan children. And 13 US troops. It's quarter past seven on the 26th or 7th. I'm standing out the front of Emergency Hospital in central Kabul. It's the, it's the main war trauma uh, facility in the, in the capital. And there's just been two uh, blasts of some kind at, the, at one of the gates at the at Kabul airport. And they're just streaming in here like I can't remember um, patients. I don't know, I've been here for 15 minutes and there's been at least, uh, I don't know, a couple of dozen, and there are a couple of dozen that came before me, and they keep coming. I'd never seen such a steady stream. It was like a conveyor belt of, of dead and wounded coming in, just one after the other after the other. It was a terrible irony for the United States which went to Afghanistan 20 years ago to rid the country of terrorism. To those who carried out this attack, as well as anyone who wishes America harm, know this, we will not forgive. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. A minute before midnight on August 30, the last US plane flew out of Kabul to the sound of Taliban gunfire. Conversations I've had with people in Afghanistan uh, tend to reflect a pervasive sense of horror at how circumstances have changed. I think the worst single thing about the kind of macroscopic environment which has now been created is a complete death of hope. I feel an immense sense of sadness at the way in which things have played out in Afghanistan. Some people inevitably will now begin to say that the Western project in Afghanistan was doomed. I don't think it was doomed, it was botched. It was botched as account of, on account of the clumsy and maladroit handling of the situation in Afghanistan by successive uh, US presidents who were simply not fit to hold major public office in an important state. I don't wanna say I'm hopeless, but allow me to say that it's hard to be betrayed by your friend rather than your enemy. It's hard to believe that we've been used for a political project rather than democratic values. It's hard for us to believe that all those beautiful sentences where was been preaching by worldwide leaders for Afghanistan was just a lip service, nothing more. Women are going to suffer 
A, because of the displacement, B, because of the losing job opportunities. Majority of Afghanistan has widows and orphans, and they want to get uh, through their day in one piece. They have very small jobs, and all those jobs are going to be lost. Learning opportunities are going to be lost. Afghanistan is going to become a prison for women because there is no mobility, no socialization. While the Taliban leadership has promised a more enlightened regime, Afghans are sceptical. It's going to be a very jarring experience. So just the idea of a Taliban-type regime re-emerging, even if it's Taliban light, is going to be intolerable for most Afghans. It's going to be intolerable for the young, particularly for our women, for our minorities, for the middle class uh, Afghans. So I, I can understand why people are hiding. I can understand why people are fearful. And people are knocking on doors, they're asking for names, they're trying to figure out who's living where. People have disappeared. When you don't have the right to talk, when you're hiding your identity, when you don't have uh, the right of free movement or choice, what do you think? It's not a cage? We are People of Afghanistan right now are living in a cage. Yes, I feel that. I feel we are in a cage. When there's no freedom, when there's no rights, when there's no justice, when there's no little hope, what should I say? If I describe the situation, if I say what is the situation at the moment and the frustration and the chaos, we've been divided. It's, it's hard. I think a cage is the right name I can give. The week after the fall of Kabul, Shukriya Barakzai managed to escape and flew out to London. Hassan and his young family managed to cross the border into Pakistan. But the Home Affairs Department has now said his visa was issued in error he remains, like others who served the coalition forces, in limbo. Andrew Quilty has decided that for now, he'll stay. I think, um, personally, I, I'm, I'm in a bit of a numb stage where um, I'm just sort of coming to terms with this, this new normal and trying to work out my you know, where I fit in, how I fit in, if I can fit in. And, um, you know, still to an extent holding my breath about what's to come, like, like everyone else here. After the chaos, the crowds have now gone and Kabul's airport lies empty. Life, I don't think, will go back to normal. I mean, a lot of Afghans won't go back to the jobs that they had, or the work that they did. A lot of those jobs will cease to exist even, I think. Kabul has certainly become hollowed out. My community really has almost evaporated overnight. I'd say the future's still uncertain and that Kabul and, and probably Afghanistan as a whole is still collectively holding its breath. The Taliban have said that they bear no grudges and that anyone who worked for the government or the security forces or foreigners in the past are free to stay, all is forgiven. There are not many Afghans that I've met who believe them. Um, and I, I desperately want to believe them. And I'm not sure whether I'm naive to do so, but I desperately want to believe them. And I desperately hope that um, their actions follow the words. The West will be haunted by the decisions that they take with regards to Afghanistan if they do turn a blind eye today the same way they did in the 90s. It will come back to haunt them. Uh, and it's a vicious cycle in repeat. 
I want to spread the word and I want the world to not forget about Afghanistan and not forget about Afghan people, Afghan nation, because they're in dire need right now. So I know that they're living in fear right now. They're terrified. They're all scared. They don't know what to expect. And the only thing they're hoping and praying for is for the outside community, for, for the international community to actually do something for them and help them. That's all they're hoping for.